And now it's my pleasure to turn this program over to Maya Matthews Mentor, who is the Vice President for Editorial and Production at Diverse Issues in Higher Education. Maya? Thank you, Sydney. Appreciate all that you and the entire webcast team did to bring this program to fruition. And to our viewing audience from wherever you are, good morning or good afternoon, and we hope that you are safe and we thank you for being here. These are turbulent and uncertain times to say the least, and we are thrilled that so many registrants understand the significance of this event and have chosen to attend today. On behalf of the entire staff of Diverse Issues and Higher Education, we offer you a very warm welcome to the 2020 virtual presentation of the Dr. John Hope Franklin Awards. As Sydney mentioned, we are in listen only mode today, but if you feel moved to comment or share any of the proceedings that you see, please join the conversation on Twitter at Diverse Issues. I'm coming to you today from the conference room of Cox Matthews and Associates. Cox Matthews is the parent company and publisher of Diverse Issues in Higher Education magazine and website. For the last 20 years, it is also with great pride that we have produced the John Hope Franklin Awards. For those who may not be familiar, this is our annual observance of excellence in higher education. The award was created in Dr. Franklin's name to pay tribute to and to thank America's truly great historian, scholar, researcher, author, and humanitarian. Today, we recognize three well-deserving awardees. In 2004, the inaugural award was also presented to three awardees. They were the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Dr. David Levering Lewis, an NYU historian and Pulitzer Prize winning author, and Dr. Sybil Collins Mobley, the founding Dean Emeritus of the School of Business and Industry at Florida A&M University. Since that first year, we've used this forum to recognize individuals and in some case organizations whose very contributions to higher ed are consistent with the highest standards of excellence established by Dr. Franklin. While the list of former recipients is far too long to call off by name, I encourage you to stick around at the end of today's program and we'll bring you some imagery of previous awardees. First year, we in person, these images are presented as blow-up posters and they're placed around our ballrooms and meeting rooms. They make wonderful conversation pieces and they really are a big part of what makes the evening so special. Albeit virtual, we are glad to share this slideshow with just a few of the fond memories that we have been so privileged to enjoy. Not, not pictured in the slideshow, but certainly worth noting are past recipients Dr. Janetta B. Cole, Dr. James Comer, the late Dr. Maya Angelou, and the late former representative of Georgia's fifth district, John Lewis. All leaders who moved the needle significantly in their respective area of expertise. Today's recipients are no different. Dr. Walter Allen, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, and President Frank Wu. All three embody Franklin's legacy of excellence and service, and each one has demonstrated broad impact on our nation and the world. Dr. Allen is a researcher, scholar, and educator who has molded and influenced countless professors in the academy. Professor Crenshaw is a full-time professor of law at Columbia and UCLA, and a founder of the intellectual movement called Critical Race Theory. President Wu, when first slated to receive this award back in March, was the William Prosser Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of California, Hastings College of Law. Eight short months later, he is the president of Queens College. What a feat. He is a regular contributor to Diverse. He's one of our bloggers, and we couldn't be happier about his career trajectory. Let's give a warm round of applause these recipients. And please let my individual applause here be a symbolic gesture of the rousing applause that we know that they would have received if we were in person. 
As the program progresses, you will learn about them and you will hear firsthand accounts about their contributions to the Academy. But the program is only designed to be one hour. And if the program participants and I do our jobs right, this will go very, very quickly. So if you're interested in going a little deeper and learning more about the how and the why they got to these distinguished points in their careers, we have full page profiles that can be found in our March 19th, 2020 print edition. If you aren't a subscriber, now is an excellent time to seize the moment. My shameless plug is that there will be there will also be subscription information shared at the conclusion of today's program. And speaking of support, it is at this point in the program that we want to take a brief pause and say a sincere thank you to one of our longstanding partners. As a partner, TIAA not only helped today make today's program possible, but they've also helped to make several iterations of the John Hope Franklin Award possible. Each year we anticipate, we eagerly anticipate spending quality time breaking bread with the TIAA leadership team during the ACE annual meeting where this awards program typically takes place. Although we weren't able to gather this past March due to the coronavirus pandemic, we are thrilled to be able to come together in this virtual format. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Christina Cutliff. Christina is Managing Director of Institutional Relationships and she will bring us greetings on behalf of TIAA. Christina, over to you. Thank you so much, Maya, and hello, everyone. I really do wish we could be in person, but you know, here we are. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here with you today virtually, and I'm so pleased that we are finally getting to celebrate the John Hope Franklin Award winners this year, even if it is a little later than usual and over Zoom. We always look forward to this event. Uh, but the point is we are here today and we are celebrating these well-deserving recipients. Speaking for myself and on behalf of my TIA colleagues, we are just delighted to support this program honoring the remarkable winners of this year's John Hope Franklin Award. Dr. Walter Allen, Professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, and President Frank Wu. Dr. Franklin was a staunch advocate for academic scholarship, leadership excellence, and diversity and inclusion. TIAA shares these same passions and these same ideals and is committed to leaders who are guided by them, especially now. The social justice issues that we have witnessed in 2020 have shown a spotlight on our ongoing need as a community for inclusive leadership excellence. And TIA is proud to be a partner for this very important work. TIA has always been at the forefront of inclusion with the first woman to the TIA board in 1940, the first African-American on the board in 1957, the first Fortune 500 company to hire an African-American CEO, Dr. Clifton Wharton Jr. And now with Roger Ferguson, our CEO, and one of only four African-American CEOs in the Fortune 500. At TIAA, we are committed to helping institutions and individuals pursue positive outcomes through an array of financial services and our long-term investment perspective. We are grounded by our core values, committed to responsible investing, and dedicated to being a force for good, building on our legacy of serving the broad financial needs of those who make a difference in the world. In short, our mission is to help the academic community remain vibrant so that its leaders, most of you on this call today, um, and those that we're celebrating today can continue building on Dr. Franklin's lasting legacy. And with that, I want to again offer my heartfelt congratulations to this year's award winners. You have each made enormous contributions to our, your institutions, to the community at large, and the broader higher education community recognizes your accomplishments. I also want to thank and acknowledge my friends at Diverse Magazine for all you do year in and year out to support academic excellence and diversity and inclusion. You truly make a difference and we all benefit from the impact of your work. So thank you so much for all your attention and I hope this program um, and today is um, just as much joy as it's been and I'm really looking forward to it. And with that, Maya, I'm going to um, you know, hand it back over to you. 
Thank you, Christina. Appreciate that so much. Next, it is my pleasure to welcome the President of the American Council on Education, Ted Mitchell. We thank President Mitchell for his willingness to host this program as a part of the ACE annual on-site meetings and to represent ACE as we have pivoted this program to the online format. As things go with technology, I'm not seeing President Mitchell at the moment. So um, whether he is able to bring us greetings now at the end of the program, I just want to say how grateful we are to the ACE organization. We hosted the Franklin Awards for the first time at ACE in 2011 under the leadership of Diana Cordova in the Cary office. And now we are just one shy, one year shy of a 10 year anniversary with them. Nothing has been more satisfying than the entire higher education community coming together on the occasion of presenting this particular award at the largest gathering of senior level administrators. We graciously thank them for the venue um, and we offer the president, Ted Mitchell, to offer brief remarks, if not today on this call at the final finale of the call and certainly in other iterations of the John Hope Franklin Awards. Okay, so I'm going to keep moving us along. And I know that you are as anxious as I am to get to the awards presentation, and we're almost there. But before we formally begin, I do want to take just a few minutes to give some additional background. We created this, an award, this award to institutionalize and celebrate on an ongoing and regular basis the scholarly contributions of Dr. John Hope Franklin to the nation and to the world. Among other things in his story career, Dr. Franklin researched and laid the historic foundation, context, and the strategic framework for the landmark Brown versus Topeka Supreme Court case that ended segregation as the law of the land in the United States. In that vein, this award recognizes pioneers, those who have had the courage to be first in their respective fields, and those who have also demonstrated broad impact on the nation and the world. Another thing that's special about this award is how actively Dr. Franklin was with it. This was not a name only thing for him. It was with his permission that the award was created and he was involved with every step of the process from selecting recipients to being on stage for each year's award presentation. In fact, in 2008, which was the year before he passed, he was 93 years old. Yet Dr. Franklin still graced the stage to present and to hood the red ribbon medallions that you're going to see in just a few minutes to the 2008 award winners. We don't take those special moments for granted, and it's another reason why we have tried to capture and share some of the memories over the years. Although we miss him dearly, we are grateful to draw upon those experiences with him, and we would like to believe that he'd be very proud to see Dr. Allen, Professor Crenshaw, President Wu be honored today. So with that said, let's move to the exciting task at hand and add these three richly deserving honorees to the roster of recipients. Here to introduce Dr. Walter Allen is certainly no stranger to me and perhaps no stranger to you as well. With over 40 years in higher education, he has been a professor, administrator, researcher, writer, and founding publisher of then Black Issues in Higher Education, now Diverse. He identified many years ago that the absence of a national award of this caliber and the name of Dr. Franklin represented a gaping hole in the higher education landscape, and he took action to correct that. Here we are 16 years later, and he couldn't be more enthusiastic about introducing Dr. Walter Allen, his longtime colleague. It is my pleasure to introduce my father, Frank L. Matthews. I turn it over to you. Will you please do the honors for Dr. Allen? Thank you. You know, there's a, um, a lot that we all are going to take. You know, what's going on in my video having technology problems as well. Uh, let's see, can I get it started here? But you can actually just probably have to listen to me instead. But let me speak loud and, and, uh, and so you can uh, hear me. 
You know, there's a lot that we all are going to take away from the year 2020. It's been an unprecedented year in so many ways. And for me and for my colleagues, and I'm sure for you, the, these awards this year uh, are the signature events. Uh, and no one can be more appropriately recognized than Dr. Walter Allen. Uh, as Maya pointed out, the, um, the Dr. Allen, uh, Dr. Allen is, is a, what you call a, a superstar in higher education, even though he's a very, very modest uh, man. And it's so appropriate that it come, uh, that he get the Franklin Awards because like Dr. Franklin, Dr. Allen is a scholar uh, extraordinaire. He's a people person and he genuinely cares about uh, education. Uh, I remember when I was talking to Dr. Franklin one day and he was such an approachable man. He was such a, he's, he reminds you of everybody's granddaddy. And uh, he said, uh, so I asked him about this award and he was very, very insistent on one thing and that, that is the research has to be done. He said, Frank, you can do all the marching and this and that you want to, but you got to do the heavy lifting. And that's why it's so appropriate that Dr. Allen received this award because he indeed has done the heavy lifting without uh, being arrogant or anything of this nature. And, uh, I've, and rather than me can continue to talk, I want to just share one thought, uh, a, a description of Dr. Allen from one of his students, uh, uh, Dr. Tyrone uh, Howard. And let me just read that to you. It says this, you will be hard pressed to find a more caring, thoughtful, passionate and distinguished scholar and person than Walter Allen. From the time I first met Walter over 25 years ago when I was a graduate student, he made me feel much in the same way he makes everyone feel that they are the most important person in the world. I remember my hesitancy and trepidation about introducing myself to a scholar like him, who I admired and respected so much. Yet upon my initial meeting, he was engaging, generous with his time and a breath, a breath a air, fresh air uh, to those trying to find his footing in the academy. He assured, encouraged, and insisted that I find my place in this work. His words were reassuring, his convictions were palatable. I have never forgot my first exchange with Walter Allen and I have tried to emulate his uh, humanistic approach to how he does his work with the people I interact with. You will be hard pressed to find anyone who utters a negative word about Walter. His presence commands a room, his, his wisdom is endless and his commitment to justice is never ending. I cannot think of a more deserving recipient of the John Hope Franklin Award than Dr. Allen. He is the change agent that we want to see. He is an intellectual giant and a scholar who inspires us all. He embodies the principles of fairness, integrity, and honor. And I am humbled to not only call him a colleague, but I'm even more honored to call him a friend and a brother. So that's what one of uh, Dr. Allen's uh, successful students, who's now a professor himself, has said. So that's 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 what's important. And I also want to read just very briefly a passage from from Slavery to Freedom. And as you may know, that that is the definitive work by John Hope Franklin. It's now in its eighth edition. Over three and a half million copies have been sold, and it is a uh, it's still the standard. It's the gold standard for excellence in research about uh, the African-American experience uh, in the United States. And he's talking about a period between uh, at the end of the Civil War until the turn of the century. And he stresses the importance of education. And he says this, the pursuit of knowledge therefore came to be one of the greatest preoccupations of African-Americans and education was viewed at, by many as the single greatest opportunities to escape the increasing prescriptions and the indignities that whites leaped on blacks, heaped on blacks. Small wonder that many black children were sent to school even when it was a great hardship to their parents. The number of black students doubled in, that, in the decades after the South was quote unquote redeemed. The literacy among 
African Americans declined dramatically, following, falling from 95% in 1865 to about 50% by, 18, by 1900. Numerous black fathers and mothers made untold sacrifices to secure for their children the learning that had been, had been, they had been denied. So I think that speaks to where Dr. Franklin felt about education and why he was, uh, he, was, he was fixed on the idea. He knew Dr. Allen and he would just be so happy to know that an educator, a person who recognizes the value and the power of education to be receiving this award. So uh, Dr. Uh, Allen, uh, we extend our sincere congratulations. Thank you for all that you have done. And uh, we, uh, it's my pleasure to present you with the virtual hooding of the John Hope, the 2020 John Hope Franklin Award. Dr. Allen. Thank you, thank you. I've known Frank Matthews since the earliest days of my career. He has been a vital source of inspiration and information as publisher of Black Issues in Higher Education and later Diverse Education. Thank you, Frank, for your many contributions and for your kind words of introduction. At this moment, I'm a jumble of emotions as I humbly and gratefully accept this honor. Against the backdrop of one of the most challenging and tumultuous periods in our nation's history, my heart goes out to those who have suffered loss and to those who find themselves in the grips of despair. We must believe that there are, high, that there are brighter days ahead. We must cling firmly to the confidence and belief that spirit and ancestors did not bring us this far to leave us now. Led by the Black Lives Matter movement, people rose up across the nation to demand racial and economic justice, to demand that this nation live up to its promise as a beacon in the world. Dr. John Franklin embodied all that is admirable in our nation and in human beings. He was a first rank scholar and person and dedicated to progressive social change and social activism and ultimately to the realization of dreams for all Americans and all people. There's a straight line from the racist injustice he faced as a child when his family home was burned by rampaging racist mobs in Tulsa through the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and into the televised racist lynching of George Floyd. Now, Dr. Franklin was a truth teller, an African griot who chronicled black history in the most profound and detailed ways. Remarkably, from my point of view, he did not give in to bitterness and despair, even as he faced fairly, squarely, the, 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 the situation for black people in this, in this country. He was, for that reason and so many others, an example for those of us who tried to model our careers after him. Like him, we were determined to rise and draw others up with us. Mm -hmm. I thank family, friends, my students, and my colleagues who have been the wind beneath my wings over what has been a blessed life and career. Your names are too numerous to mention here, but know that I appreciate you, each and every one of you, beyond words. Thanks from the bottom of my heart for all you've done to sustain and support me, to shelter me, to bring me joy, to inspire and educate me, to direct my purpose and footsteps. I must, of course, give special thanks to my clan, my wife, Kathy, who is my number one fan and critic, my children, Benjamin, Brian, Rena, and Benty, and my eight grandchildren, and my one great-grand, my sisters and my brothers. You combine to be the village that has nurtured and loved me through it all. I especially appreciate our ancestor, 
my mother and the sacrifice and example that she represented. Freddie Mae Allen grew up in the, under the racist depression, the racial oppression, under that tough, tough circumstance of life as a black woman in Mississippi. But she kept hope alive and showed us all that she, she showed us that all things are possible if you believe and then get busy doing the necessary work. So I, I just thank you all once again and peace and blessings as we go forward in the struggle that accomplishing what Dr. John Hope Franklin has set before us. Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Allen. We appreciate those gracious remarks. Next, we honor Professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Here to introduce Professor Crenshaw is the brilliant Dr. Marilyn Sanders Mobley. Dr. Mobley is Professor of English and African American Studies at Case Western Reserve University. And from 2009 to 2019, she was the university's inaugural VP for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity. She's also a former president of the Toni Morrison Society, and she is a wonderful friend to diverse. Just before the pandemic hit, she was giving a lecture at her old stomping ground of George Mason University, where she talked very, very passionately about Professor Crenshaw and her impact on race and gender issues. We're located right up the road from George Mason University. And when we got wind of that uplifting presentation, we knew that she was just the person to do the job here today. Dr. Mobley, would you please do the introduction honors for Professor Crenshaw? I pass it over to you. Thank you, Maya. It's an honor to be part of this important diverse issues tradition of recognizing thought leaders who have made a difference Whenever I'm at the ACE event, I always attend this event. It is a highlight for me. And it is a tremendous honor to have this opportunity to introduce a scholar and public intellectual whose work I have admired and referenced for so many years. I recall a group of graduate students at Case Western Reserve University, where I am now, who asked me could they meet? And I thought, like many students, they wanted to get money for their event. They said, no, we need you to help us get Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. These, they wanted her help for their LGBTQ conference, and I did my best to help them. But they, were, of course, were up against the wall of her previous commitments and engagements. So we know in higher ed, she is indeed a rock star. The honor of being able to introduce her is an extra special one for me for another reason. When I shared with Dr. Pat Mathieu Stewart, a woman I refer to as my mother sister friend, that I would be giving a guest lecture, first the one that Maya mentioned, and then at Barnard College, using Professor Kimberly Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality, Dr. Pat began regaling me with stories of how she knew Professor Crenshaw's family, from her days back in the Massillon Canton community in Ohio. She shared that Dr. Williams, Kimberly Crenshaw's maternal grandfather, was not only a physician, but also the go-to community activist whose house was considered a safe space for people to come to discuss ways to resolve social justice issues. In fact, Dr. Pat told me that Professor Kimberly's parents have the same reputation of being staunch community activists. So I learned from her that Professor Crenshaw's activism roots run deep. That said, she has been a phenomenal um, professor uh, in the law field and scholar and activist in her own right. Professor Crenshaw is the Isidore and Seville Sobacher Professor of Law at Columbia University Law School and she is Distinguished Professor of Law and the Promise Institute Chair in Human Rights at the UCLA School of Law. She earned her BA from Cornell, her JD from Harvard, and her LLM from the University of Wisconsin. She teaches civil rights and other courses in critical race studies, constitutional law, and Black feminist legal theory. In fact, she's known as one of the leading 
scholars around the nation in the field of critical race theory. She was a law clerk for the Honorable Shirley Abramson in the Wisconsin Supreme Court from 1985 to 1986. And she has had academic appointments at the Sorbonne, at the London School of Economics, the University of Paris 8 in France, as a Fulbright in Brazil, at the European University Institute Law Department Exchange in Florence, Italy, and she has facilitated workshops in India and South Africa. Her scholarship was part of the Equality Clause in the South African Constitution. How cool is that? And she authored the background paper on race and gender discrimination in the United Nations World Conference on Racism in 2001. She was a fellow at the Fletcher Foundation in 2008 and was selected that same year to serve at the Center for Advanced Study at Stanford. She has several publications. I hope you already have them in your library. Critical Race Theory, Words That Wound, Critical Race Theory, Assaultive Speech, and the First Amendment. With Andrea Ritchie, she co-authored Say Her Name, Resisting Police Brutality Against Black Women, which documented and drew attention to the killing of Black women and girls by the police. And in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement, it was always so wonderful to think about what Say Her Name has contributed to raising up the names of women and girls. She also is co-author of Black Girls Matter, pushed out, over-policed, and under-protected. Her writing has appeared in the Harvard Law Review, the National Black Law Journal, the Stanford Law Review, and the Southern California Law Review. Professor Crenshaw is the co-author and executive director of the African American Policy Forum, the host of the podcast Intersectionality Matters, and moderator of the webinar series Under the Black Light and the activist known for developing the Say Her Name campaign. If you haven't seen the video about that, you really need to see it, it will move you. When Toni Morrison gave her Nobel lecture in 1993, she said, and I quote, oppressive language does more than represent violence, it is violence. Does more than represent the limits of knowledge, it limits knowledge, unquote. In her teaching, scholarship, and activism, Professor Crenshaw has illustrated in high style through intellectual power and with bold commitment that she understands what Toni Morrison meant by those words. Through her work, Professor Crenshaw has advocated for women and girls and helped people regardless of their race, gender, socioeconomic status, sexuality, ability, age, or national origin to understand the value and the intellectual power of reading through the lens of intersectionality as a way of seeing the parts of our identity, how the parts of our identity interact, affect access, and shape our lived lives. Or as Professor Crenshaw says in her own words, intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects. It's not simply that there is a race problem here, a gender problem here, and a class or LGBTQ problem there, unquote. It is no surprise that she is one of the most cited and quoted legal scholars in the history of the law, and that Prospect Magazine in 2019 named her as one of the 10 most important thinkers. Professor Crenshaw, I know I speak for scholars and people all around this nation and the world, including my graduate students who came to get you, when I say thank you for the extraordinary work you have done to give language to our concerns, our issues, our challenges, and all the ways we matter. You have understood that after the marches, after the protests, policy matters. As Phoebe says in Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, we have grown 10 feet just listening to you and learning from you. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, congratulations. It is my pleasure to present your virtual hooding of the 2020 Dr. John Hope Franklin Award. This is mm, such a special honor. Um, I would love to share how beautiful uh, this honor uh, is. Um, I have to take a moment um, that was just so um, moving, particularly to hear my um, grandparents and my parents um, brought into the conversation. So I so appreciate 
um, your um, research and um, finding uh, about the history and the shoulders upon which I stand. It is so deeply meaningful, me, for, meaningful for me to receive the John Hope Franklin Award uh, in this moment in particular and also to be ushered into this with the stellar company of um, Dr. Marilyn Mobley. Uh, what a wonderful introduction. And also to uh, be uh, receiving this with two colleagues who I have long considered part of my intellectual community and more importantly, part of the great we of this generation that gained access into a higher education um, and around which we have built a, a, a sense of a collective project. Um, this is so important, especially at this particular moment. So I'm honored uh, to be with them uh, on this moment. Um, the need to reckon with our past uh, is um, what Dr. Franklin so ardently called for. And it rings especially true in this moment in which a sitting American president has issued an executive order attempting to silence and eliminate from public discourse an array of social justice concepts that were inspired uh, by Dr. Franklin and his entire generation. Concepts like diversity, inclusion, implicit bias, critical race theory, and intersectionality. Now these concepts grow out of a paradigm shift that Dr. Franklin helped to lead, one that connects this nation's history of genocide and of slavery and of manifest destiny and of apartheid to persistent racial inequalities that extend to this day. Um, he and others occupied this insistence that we not shy away from confronting American orthodoxy, um, an orthodoxy that's set on erasing these shameful histories rather than interrupting their continued legacy. Dr. Franklin understood that realizing the cherished ideals of racial equity really requires us to develop and transmit knowledge about how racism shaped our society and also requires us to develop the tools in order to recognize its continuing presence in order to interrupt them. Now, to address the lingering dimensions of our nation's long history of white supremacy, we have to set aside the discomforts that are born out of guilt, born out of denial, those that underscore this executive order. And what we have to do is embrace instead the truths and the tools that allow us to redouble our commitment to liberty and justice for all. And in the centrality of this work is history, as we know about Dr. Franklin's contribution to Brown versus Board of Education, without which critical race theory and the work I do would not be possible. So Dr. Franklin was a scholar in action, one that was not afraid to put scholarship in the service of social justice. And in this way, um, I feel so much a part of his family. Uh, neither he nor the rest of us saw ourselves as scholars um, simply because we're uh, interested in ideas for their own sake, nor do we just sit in our offices generating um, ideas. We do what we do. We think the thoughts that we think to inspire transformative change. Those of us who think these thoughts um, to do so are walking in the footsteps of Dr. Franklin. And so it is this sensibility from this generation of race men and women that inspires the work that I do. It inspires the effort to institutionalize that work in the African American Policy Forum and in the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies. And so it is with this hope um, that we lift up the legacy of Dr. Franklin and the generational torch that he and others have passed on to us. And to protect this light, we want to begin um, what we're calling a truth be told campaign 
that calls not simply for the repeal of this outrageous order, but that also sees us in need of a requirement that these histories, the true history of the United States, be an absolute requirement throughout all of our educational institutions. We want to do this in hopes that we can interrupt a lesson that Dr. Franklin taught us, that without the history of the oppressed, without the confrontation with those fundamental contradictions that shape this republic, we may win some battles, but we will not win the war. We cannot come this far and fail to pass the lessons of our past on to those who inspire and aspire to a greater future. So in these uncertain times, it's more critical than ever that we realize the hopeful determination that John Hope Franklin continuously sought. I'm honored to accept this award. And I feel that in fighting for transformative justice, we all are in a way fighting for his legacy. We know he rests in power as each of us in our own way continue his struggle. Thank you so much for this tremendous honor. Thank you, Professor Crenshaw. We have, congratulations. We thank you for sharing with us and thank you for reminding us about the importance of making sure these histories are being taught systematically today. Last, and only because we're going in alphabetical order, but certainly not least, we recognize President Frank H. Wu. Here to introduce President Wu is Dr. Carol Padden. Dr. Padden is Dean of the Division of Social Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. As mentioned earlier, this program was slated to take place in March, um, exactly eight months ago, eight months to the date in San Diego, California. Dean Padden graciously agreed to come over to the Marriott Marina and offer President Wu these remarks. And while I regret that we were not able to do so and to meet her in person, I know that there will be many opportunities in the future, and we certainly are looking forward to those. Please offer my sincerest thanks, Dr. Patton, to your ASL interpreters and your entire team that made your presence today possible. Without further ado, will you please do the honors and present President Frank H. Wu. I turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. And, and warm welcome to everyone. I am pleased to recognize and honor Frank H. Wu, who is currently the president of Queens College, City University of New York, as the awardee for this year's Dr. John Hope Franklin Award. In the spirit of the award, which recognizes individuals who contribute to the equity and excellence in higher education, Frank's, Frank's commitment to equity has been very broad and deep. I first met him when we served together on the Board of Trustees at Gallaudet University, the, the world's first only liberal arts college for deaf and hard of hearing students. This was a fitting appointment for Frank, as Frank at the time was a professor at Howard University a law professor, which was founded around the same time that Gallaudet University was founded. Howard was founded in 1867 and Gallaudet in 1864. Both were chartered by the U.S. Congress. He joined the board a few years after Gallaudet University just installed their very first deaf president, King Jordan. And he worked alongside all of us to institutionalize the, a different administration with his knowledge and help us to advance educational opportunities for deaf people in a new era of diversity and inclusion. Frank understood early in his career that making a difference in working for equity in education would require that he place himself in many different opportunities as possible. Indeed, if you look at his vita, you will see that in addition to his law school professorship at Howard University, he also served at Wayne State University where he was the Dean of the Law Office. Then he moved on to UC Hastings College of Law and was a chancellor and dean there. He is a prolific 
writer. And he has authored two very important major publications, one about Asian American discrimination and equity called Yellow and Race in America Beyond Black and White. He was also a co-author for a major report from the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund called Race, Rights, and Reparations, Law and the Japanese American Internment. He is viewed in popular press as a major voice for Asian American life in the United States. But in all his work, he is sought to bring together all parts of his life experiences as a professor, as a dean, as a chancellor, as a, an author, and his multitudes of perspectives. He really lived that life of looking at civil rights in a diverse way. Today, in his position, in his new position, uh, he is now president of Queens College. He brings an, an, an extraordinary depth of knowledge and broad empathy and the challenge of guiding the institution to the, it, through these times and beyond. Congratulations, Frank. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you. I am humbled and honored, especially uh, to have a friend such as Carol say uh, such kind words. I'd like to take a moment to talk about the importance in this divided time of ours, when everyone is anxious and on edge. I'd like to take a moment to talk about bridge building and coalitions and how they will see us through. As you heard, I began my career at Howard University. I was honored to be the first Asian American to serve as a law professor at that leading historically black institution of higher education. To tell you the truth, I learned as much as I taught. I realized that despite myself, I have prejudice as we all do, what we call unconscious bias or implicit prejudice now. I also saw just walking down the street that I enjoyed privilege that I didn't even notice. That changed my life in a way that no academic research possibly could have. And it made me see the importance of having a mission, not just as an individual, but for an institution. And how all of us are enriched by going those places people wouldn't expect to see us and where we might not have expected to find ourselves. Then as a trustee at College Act, the only institution of higher education in the world serving predominantly deaf and hard of hearing, I saw again how assumptions turn out to be wrong. The interpreters on campus were there for me, a hearing person. Everyone who was deaf was perfectly capable in that bilingual environment of socializing or carrying on discussion in the boardroom. They didn't need the interpreter at all. I was the one who is disabled. So as we come to see the importance of inclusion, I worry that those of us who are neither black nor white, Asian Americans, those who are newcomers or just perceived as newcomers to these shores, will be brought in as spoilers of sorts, as in the Harvard case, which thank goodness uh, came uh, to the just conclusion uh, even as it works its way up to the high court. The model minority myth of Asian Americans is false flattery. It isn't even a compliment really of Asian Americans. It, it's inaccurate because so many of them represent brain drain, people who are coming with human or financial capital. Well, it's a none too subtle way of holding them up and saying to African Americans, Latinx persons and others, other people of color, look at the Asians, they made it. Why can't you? And regrettably, there are some Asian Americans, those tiger moms and others, who would embrace that notion that they are smarter and harder working as standardized tests would show uh, as uh, they uh, promote it as the be all and end all. And they lack the respect for the very civil rights movement that changed policies so that they could enter the nation 
and become members of the community. We can do better than that through education by ensuring that we all understand how the historic struggle for black equality, which goes on to this day, has benefited each and every one of us. It is then with gratitude, not only for those who preceded me and us, but for those who followed that I accept this award. And I urge us as we come together in healing after four terrible years and this pandemic, not only that we stay safe and look at the science, but that we rebuild and appeal to the better sides of our nature, each and every one of us. I'd like to go back to that moment when we can talk to strangers and communicate when it's safe and not dangerous. And I don't just mean because of the health risk, but I mean because we all feel fraught and distant now, not just socially, but distant politically and in every other respect. It is to that that I've dedicated my life, and I know that all of you who are part of this have as well. Thank you so very much. Thank you, President Wu. Congratulations. We appreciate those thoughtful and instructive comments. I knew this would be a special event, and that has certainly turned out to be the case. Uh, before we close, I want to circle back to the ACE President, Ted Mitchell. I'm sure I know that you caught the lion's share of today's awards program and will agree uh, that this is a very, very uplifting experience. We are um, thrilled to have you here today. And before we move to closing, I want to come back to you, welcome you, and invite you to weigh in on today's event. Thank you. I turn it over to you. Great, thank you, thank you, Maya, and uh, it's been a it's been a terrific opportunity to uh, listen to the uh, to the presentations and to uh, be a part of be a part of the discussion. I, I I've been on from the beginning, uh, couldn't break through the Zoom wall, but I'm happy to have done so now. Um, so I'm moved. Uh, I am uh, rededicated, uh, as I think we all are, after hearing from our awardees uh, today. And I just want to say a couple of things. First, um, on behalf of ACE, congratulations uh, to, to our three winners. Uh, there is no um, higher purpose for the American Council on Education than celebrating your contributions uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and we're sorry that we couldn't participate uh, in San Diego in person uh, on this event, but we're really delighted to be able to be a part of it. Uh, uh, here online. Uh, we hope to be able to be a part of uh, the John Hope Franklin Award uh, uh, going forward in person and want to thank Diverse uh, Magazine for uh, uh, continuing to be the, the, the sponsor. I, I often think that the ACE annual meeting is, is merely organized around uh, this event uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to uh, to do, to do the work that draws us, us together. I also want to thank uh, TIAA uh, for their sponsorship and Christina for her, her remarks uh, earlier today. I hope that you know that at ACE, uh, one of our major strategic commitments uh, is to equality, uh, to equity, and to diversity. Uh, we just this week came out with our second annual report on race and ethnicity in higher education. Uh, it's worth noting the progress that we've made, but unfortunately, uh, the far distance that we have to go to achieving equitable success for all racial groups in higher education. You'll also note, I hope, uh, that ACE and our colleague associations have been at the forefront of opposing uh, the Trump administration's executive orders that have been aimed not only to continue repression, but to blind us uh, to the issues that too often divide us. We will continue that struggle. We will continue to do that in fellowship with Diverse, with TIAA, and with today's honorees. Had the pleasure of talking about many of these issues with Dr. Franklin uh, on my back porch a decade ago. 
Uh, and I have been inspired by his example, as I know we all have. And it's a coming full circle for us to hear from our awardees today to rededicate and recommit ourselves uh, to all of the issues that Dr. Franklin uh, continued to pursue with courage, with dignity, with a sense of humor and humility going forward. So Maya, I'll turn it back over to you, but uh, with incredible gratitude for all of the work that you've done uh, and incredible respect uh, and awe for today's honorees. Thank you so much, Ted. We appreciate those heartfelt remarks. And I just have to say that we've all faced our own Zoom walls. I like that terminology, the Zoom wall. <laughs> so we appreciate you sticking with it. We have to do that often in this environment to, to make sure that you got through, you know, better late than never. And so we, we appreciate the flexibility and that you were here and able to join and able to hear this important. A privilege. Thanks. I also want to thank your um, you know, very important leadership staff and planners at ACE that do just an incredible job with a, a gathering that large in and out every year. So thank you so much. And we look forward to many more. Before we close, um, I just want to thank you. I want to thank everyone who is on this call and in this audience today for allowing you to serve us for the last 36 years. We look forward to remaining in contact with each and every one of you here today. Um, if you have nominations or if you have feedback um, for next year's presentation of this award, please come to me directly. My email is Maya, M-A-Y-A. -A. That's Maya, M-A-Y-A, -A, at diverseeducation.com. I welcome your engagement, your feedback, um, and again, any nominations that you would like to share for the 2021 version of this award. To close us out, it said that a picture says a thousand words. So we're going to take a memory lane. I can take a walk down memory lane and look at some of the previous John Hope Franklin Award ceremonies as was promised earlier in today's discussion. We hope you enjoy the remainder of your Monday. And after the slideshow, webcast host Sydney Reese will close us out. Our 2009 awardee pictured here is Dr. Arturo Madrid, Professor Emeritus at Trinity University. He was recognized here during the annual meeting of Excellencia in Education. In 2011, to the left, Marion Wright Edelman, president and founder of the Children's Defense Fund, along with Dr. Edmund Gordon, professor emeritus at Yale University. In 2012, we honor president emeritus of San Francisco State University, Dr. Robert Corrigan. He is joined to the right by Christopher Edley, and Dr. Gary Orfield, who were recognized together for jointly founding the Civil Rights Project. In 2013, to the left is President Emeritus of the University of Virginia, Dr. John Castine. Dr. Mary Futrell is pictured center, and to the right is Dr. William Julius Wilson, Harvard University. In 2014, we recognized President Emeritus of Cal State LA, Dr. James Rosser. He is flanked on the right and the left by those who introduced him that day, that evening in California, Dr. Millie Garcia and Dr. Ben Quillen. Last, but certainly not least, is an image of Dr. Franklin himself. It's such a gracious pose. And although this was not taken at one of our previous ceremonies, we really wanted to share this with you um, so that you could understand a little bit more about the medallions that you saw the awardees today sharing with you. This was the image that was used for the handcrafted medallion. So this is actually the likeness and image that is used 
on the medallions that each recipient award, uh, award winner received today, as well as past recipients. It's a beautiful portrait, and we're just so uh, happy to share it with you and let you know how it fits in to the design of this award. And with that, I am going to pass it back to webcast host, Danae Reese, to close us out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maya. And thank you for attending the 2020 Dr. John Hope Franklin Virtual Award Ceremony, brought to you with support from TIAA. Also, please look for our upcoming podcast series, which is called In the Margins. That's right, In the Margins. To hear more, search for In the Margins on App Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and all major platforms. We look forward to your readership. If you are not a subscriber, please visit us at diverseeducation.com and click subscriber at the top left to sign up for our free e-newsletters. There's literally five of them. Click subscription in the top left corner. We look forward to your readership again, and thank you so much for attending the Dr. John Hope Franklin Award Ceremony. We thank you for attending, and we hope to see you at the next presentation of the Dr. John Hope Franklin Award Ceremony. Thank you.